oftentimes we have all these religious words that we throw around, especially if you've been around church for any length of time. Stop, pull yourself back. So what does that mean, the anointed? You know, like I want all that God has for my life. I've given him my heart 40 some years ago, but yet I have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has me. Right. The difference. And the surrender can be. You know, and so I want that as anointing is his, his hand. You know, when you anoint somebody with oil, you, you put oil on them. And, and I want to touch the Lord like that this year. This, and the second line, the music he gives sets the nations free. Because so in the small day when I think about 2023 as a Lord, the, the, the thing came to me, be free in 2023, you know. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it's going to be for me, for you. But I thought, I don't know. Lord, the music he gives sets the nations free. And our nations need to be free. They need to know God. And guess what? We're called to be that voice in the wilderness. Today, when you hear his voice... The oil of joy is anointing his children. Father, I want your anointing this morning. I ask that for the men's group here this morning. Everybody present in the sound of my voice. And those in the room this morning, God. Lord, we love you. There is no hope but you. There is no other way. There is no way other way into the kingdom but you, Jesus. Will you give us fresh eyes, a fresh heart, a fresh fire for this year, God? I know the first year is kind of a a set point or it's a re-examining, it's a resetting time time, or just to re-look at our goals and our visions that you may have for us. So, Lord, pour that out upon us this morning as men who want to love you and walk with you and speak of you, speak your name, and sing songs that will set the nations free. Lord, we honor you. We love you. We're going to do Let Me Be the One, Bob. I don't know if you know this song, but it goes like this.
Check. Check there. That one works. Don't go anywhere. Hey, good morning, fellas. <laughs> Technology is our best friend. <laughs> oh, hey, so uh, happy New Year, everybody. Wow, it's like, uh, where's everybody been? I haven't seen them all year. You know how the lights were out. Light. Last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that. Yeah, that was that was last week. That's a theater term. Bob Bob King knows that term, going dark. Yeah. Hey, happy New Year, uh, boy! What a joy. I mean, this always a highlight of our week, isn't it? To be able to gather as uh, as brothers and um, always seeing new faces and old faces and not old, not just old, but you know. <laughs> I, I don't know why I looked at Gary when I said that, but <laughs> and bald faces. Oh, thanks, appreciate it. Uh, so um, a couple things. We have a we have a packed morning, so we're gonna we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, we heard from a, a gentleman that lives in Texas now uh, a couple days ago, and he sent a video, and he'd like to say hello to you if that's okay. Yeah, Steve, go ahead and roll that for us, would you? Good morning, men of God. I greet you in the love of Jesus the Christ. I wish I was there with you today. And I'm praying that in this new year, 2023, our Lord will overwhelm you with his presence, overwhelm you with his grace, overwhelm you with his mercy, overwhelm you with his righteousness, overwhelm you with his peace and his joy. And I'm going to ask something of you. Let's pray that there will be a revival in the churches of Paso Robles so that there can be an awakening within the community. And I wanted you to also know I want to thank you for your encouragement, your prayers, and your finances for the Lord here in Texas is doing a work in and through us. I look forward to a revival taking place, and I want to tell you how much I love you. God's richest blessings to you. God bless. He's still, you notice he's still in the motorhome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Texas is a big state. You know, you just can't, you know, go buy a house anywhere. Yeah, you could. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, hey, and along those lines, you know that, saying we, that, that song we just sang, Let Me Be the One? Uh, you know, that was written by Gary, right? And uh, you're doing something with that, aren't you? Yeah, you know, you guys were here, uh, I think it was. I don't know, sometime last year where we did a live recording, catching, we were singing it. But we're at a place where we're, it's, it's almost done. We're recording the song professionally, and it's going to go down to L.A. probably either end of this week or first of the week to get mastered and all that stuff. But, you when know, you, obviously. When you, said, when you say that we recorded it, we recorded it in here, didn't we? Yes. We, we set, my son came in, set some mics up, and uh, we played it. We caught you guys singing on it. As well as uh, the, the, you know, that we had some instruments we put, you know, had we had to pay, we had some guitar work done and some, anyway, different things that we've added. <clears throat> but um, the recording has been, you know, some of it was done here, some has been done in the studio. But we're at a place where we're going to, we want to finish it up. I want to get it done. Gus has, he's got something happening over there. We've been wanting to, we've been trying to get this together and through COVID and everything else. Mm -hmm. but, just seems like one thing after the other, things got held up or backed up, and we couldn't get this done or that. Anyway, we're at that point now where it's, it's down. It's going to be mastered uh, uh, cool. in L.A. and we'll, we and get it back. You know, it's, there is a cost involved in everything, as you know, since the time we started to now has gone up a little bit. But we're, we need to we need to come up with about two thousand dollars to finish the project or to, to basically to, to pay for the whole thing. So yeah, um, that's why Lars is here this morning. <clears throat> oh God bless. You. He's going to have to trade in one of those Chevy <laughs> trucks, you know, sell it. Yeah. Anyway, so we're putting that out there this morning. If you guys want to be, can be part of that, want to, uh, you know, we have uh, some funds, but it's a little bit limited. Yes, sir. What's that? What's the goal? The goal, the goal is $2,000. Yes. Oh. Well, the song, the song, we're going to make it available for you guys. We're going to make it available to other men's groups. Uh, Gus wants to take it to uh, Texas, and as he's working with uh, uh, 
you know, I don't know if he's going to launch Band of Brothers back there as well, but a lot of guys have asked him to be part of a, a men's a mentoring programs and different things that they're launching. Yeah, Carl, the, the, go the goal, Paul, is to advance the kingdom of God with it. To yeah. Utilize it as a yeah. yeah. To utilize to, it as an anthem for 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 other men's groups to uh, to do what it's done for us. Yeah. Right. So uh, you know, it's been it's, it's kind of been been our signature song and and so on. So. Yeah. Um, so just as as we as we begin. This new year and this this phase of uh, uh, of our walk, um, two grand uh, obviously is a piece of cake, and uh, I think we got like fifteen or something for for Gus's book, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah and yeah, that's 15 been fifteen grand. Yeah, and that's yeah. and that's gone all, all over the world as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Uh, new York Times bestseller. I I don't quite think so, Trent. But you know, um, Gus is big in in our world, but. Uh, the world of literature, uh, the world of books is a little harder to, to, to crack into. Um, let, me, let me just say this, and then, and then we'll get moving. Um, if you want to write a check, write it to OBG, but in the memo line put, uh, uh, yeah, recording or something that'll, that'll cue us. If you want to do cash, put it in one of the envelopes that is in the basket and write the same thing, and then, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, let's open up in prayer, and uh, then we're going to jump right into the reading. And uh, um, when I say don't dally, okay, don't take that the wrong way, but, but stay focused on uh, the scripture and what the question is, because I'm going to try to cover as much material as the Lord's going to allow me today. It's just not going to be enough time, but that's okay. Uh, Pastor Mike said I can go to 730, so that's cool. <laughs> oh, 8.30. Fantastic. That's even better. All right. So, Father God, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this brand new year. Father, I thank you for your word. Um, I thank you that it's alive, that it's active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it's going to accomplish um, exactly what your will is, and it's not going to return void, Father. Um, I thank you for your sons that are in this room that sit here right now that are seeking you, that are panting like a deer pants for water, Father. I just ask a blessing on them in their brand new year. I don't know what all of their endeavors are. I don't know what all of their, their ailments are, Father, but we know that you're sovereign and that you're in control. And, and Father, as Gus said, praying for revival for our churches, Father, there are so many. As we're going to see this morning in the state of our theology here in America, we're going to see that there are a lot of men that profess they are Christian, but yet they either don't live it or they don't realize that they've been redeemed, or maybe their father, they're not redeemed at all. And may this be a year, Father, that we finally break through in some of these uh, households and some of these men, Father. Uh, we, just, we just pray that you allow us to rest here this morning, that you clear our hearts and our minds from the things that are on our schedule perhaps today, and let us focus on you for this, this next hour, Father. We just love you. Uh, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this brand new year. I thank you for the rain. Father, I thank you for the breath in our very lungs. Bless us this morning as we read your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you in a couple minutes, fellas.
Okay, fellas. I appreciate your diligence. A couple more minutes. Man, grab some coffee. Probably a couple more donuts over there. And if you didn't quite get through everything, that's okay. I just realized that the, uh, the slope on this podium, coupled with the cleat that's on the bottom of the podium on this slope, is perfect for balancing my coffee cup without unduly, you know, look at that, Michael. This, this wor <laughs> that works well. That works super good. Uh, hey, so Happy New Year again. And uh, uh, I recall last year doing something similar on New Year's, although uh, now that I stand here, I, I, I can't remember what, what we taught on last year at this time, but uh, this year, we're going to talk about the state of theology in America for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, this is important, okay? And I know that we're represented by a host of different congregations and churches uh, there is, it's impossible for me to know uh, everybody to the depth of understanding what your theology might be on a particular doctrine. Okay, we'll just, I'll ju we'll just say that right from the get-go. Um, however, there's a lot of commonality that we as evangelicals, and I'm going to define that term here in a minute, have. And we have to understand what those commonalities are and work within that, that framework here at the Band of Brothers and it's when we get outside of that, uh, that that we start getting into some problems. And um, But you're going to be shocked at the state of theology in America. We know that we're in decline. We know that uh, things have to happen, that the world's got to get a whole lot worse before it gets a whole lot better, right? Um but theology itself, theology, I'm not th talking about theology proper where we're studying um, God completely, but theology is the study of all things of God. Christian theology specifically is the study of the divine revelation in the Bible. It has God as its perpetual centerpiece, God's word as its source, and godliness as its aim. Sinclair Ferguson, one of my favorite guys right now that I'm uh, reading a lot on, listening to, uh, he said the goal of theology is the worship of God. The posture of theology is on one's knees. The model of theology is repentance. Everyone on this planet holds an opinion on the things of God. Therefore, they hold to a theology. Even the demons, right? We know in James 2. What matters is where and what has shaped your theology that will define who you are. What you study 
and to whom you listen matters. Accurate theology must always issue in transcendent doxology, that is, it must return as a formula of praise to God. Okay, you understand that? Um, Dr. R.C. Sproul founded Ligonier Ministries here a long time ago uh, to help people know who God is, to teach holiness, sovereignty, and glorifying God and how to glorify God. Uh, Ligonier Ministries came out um, with their biannual, or they, they do the State of Theology survey every other year. They, they cooperate or work with LifeWay Research uh, to explore what Americans believe about God, the Bible, and the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, to identify what American evangelical theology looks like at a, at a, at a particular time in history. Uh, this survey of U.S. adults includes hundreds of Christians, evangelicals, allowing a detailed exploration of their uh, beliefs on a range of theological topics. The, re the results here this last go that they just went through um, are concerning on a number of levels. Uh, though this is perhaps not unexpected at a time when many evangelical churches focus on satisfying the felt needs of people, in the congregation rather than teaching the unchanging truth of God's word. Love that. That's not my quote, that's theirs. So evangelicals were defined by LifeWay Research as people who strongly agree with the following four statements. And I want you to check yourself and see if you are in this category. Number one, the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. Number two, it is very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Evangelism. Number three, Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. And number four, only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. Okay, so now you heard those. That's how they define an evangelical. So I've selected six statements from their survey, and it's on the table here with you. And I, and I want, we're going to go through these six together, uh, and I want you to just look at the question. Okay, here's the first question, or the first statement. I just want you to look at it, and this is how I want you to grade yourself. Okay, it's on a scale from one to four. Grade yourself a one. Maybe take your pen or whatever and just write a one. Or A one is, I strongly disagree with this statement. A two is, I somewhat disagree with it. A three would be, I somewhat agree with it. And a four would be, I strongly agree with this statement. The statement is, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths but is not literally true. Now, we've been hanging out for a number of years, you and me, right? You should look at that statement and go, what in the H-E double hockey sticks, right? Okay, <laughs> okay but, but. Uh, see, I have too much fun. Okay, so again, a, a one is I strongly disagree, a five is I strongly agree, okay? So check this out. There are 26% of evangelical, they classify themselves as an evangelical who strongly agree with that statement. That's a problem. That is the highest that it's ever been. Back in 2016, that's so, so six years ago, right? They do it every two years. So four data sets ago, um, it was at 17%. Just four years ago, it was at 15%. It's now at 26%. What does that mean? We'll talk about that some more, but obviously that's a problem. If you are getting crumbs on your sport coat on a Sunday, dribbling coffee down because, you know, that's what we do when we're jaw-jacking and, 
uh, exercising and fellowship, right? <clears throat> and you're and you come across, excuse me, <clears throat> you come across um, a buddy who, yeah, you know, I was reading scripture and uh, I was reading that, you know, do you really think that that's true about Jonah? Do you really think that God created the earth in six days? Do you? And you can you can go on and on and on and on. That is your open door to grab him by the scruff and correct his theology a little bit. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit. Let's go, to, let's go to number two. Go to number two there, Steve. The statement is this. God learns and adapts to different circumstances. Grade that. No, 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 no. Don't, I don't want to hear any cat calls. No, nothing. Just grade it. One to five. Now, this is you personally. Again, this is a mature group of men, of men of God. Praise God, right, Mike? Okay. If you have a problem, oh, let me, if, before I do that, check this out. <laughs> 48%, listen to that number, 48% of evangelicals agree strongly with that statement. That's a problem. It's stupid theology. It's open theology. Yeah, there's all sorts of things. But what that means, what that means is that they don't believe that God is sovereign. And you've heard, you've heard it from this pulpit and many other pulpits that, that if there is one rogue molecule in this universe, one doing its own thing outside of God's will, then God cannot be sovereign. <clears throat> number three the cool thing about these statements is that when you go to the survey itself and you can go to uh, stateoftheology.com and they've got all of these they've got all of the data there and you can, you can spend a lot of time having fun and scoffing and, and just uh, yeah. J- anyway I, I would urge you to do that yeah, but what, what's cool about it is they have, they have biblical reference to all of these statements uh, if you have doubt or if you find yourself um, not agreeing maybe or having some, some theological issue, uh, it, it's really good. So here, check this out. <clears throat> Number three, everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. Grade that. <clears throat> what does Romans 3 say? Yeah, all have fallen short of the glory. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of our mouths are open graves. Um, babies are cute, but we know that babies have to be cute because if they weren't cute, they probably wouldn't be cared for. Right? It's like puppies and kitty cats. Right? But we have all sinned. Not, <laughs> we need a Savior. If, if this were a true statement, if everybody is born innocent and then we ultimately sin, or um, sin enters into our life, then there wouldn't be a need for a Savior. So uh, here's, I'm going to break this down uh, real quick. Um, so in addition to uh, American evangelicals, evangelicals, they also have a category. They did the same thing with just Americans, people who identified themselves as non-evangelical or non-Christian. So, um, 71% of U.S. adults strongly agree with this statement. 71%. Why? Because babies are cute, I suppose. But here's the alarming thing. 65% of American evangelicals agree with that statement. So you, you begin to see where our issue with our theology as a church, as the church, uh, begins to reveal itself. Uh, and I believe that there's a reason why this is occurring, and I'm going to 
Uh, Lord willing, if we have some time, I'll get into it a little bit. Um, let's go to number four, Steve. <coughs> this one torques me off. I'm just going to tell you, maybe I just skewed the results internally here, I don't know. But God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Allah Akbar. Fifty-six percent of American evangelicals agree with this statement. How can that be? I think you've got to go back to the first statement, that there is a lack of complete surrender to God's authority in His Word, right? And they believe that there is error in that Word, uh, and therefore, you know, there's, everybody knows that there's multiple ways to get to heaven. Yeah, just, just ask Oprah, Chris says. That's, yeah. Okay, so, but you, you kind of, you're picking up what I'm putting down, I hope, a little bit. Okay? Go to number five. Okay? This one should torque you off as well. Jesus was a great teacher. Yes, he was. But he was not actually God. I can see Brad's grin from here. 43%. Agree with that statement. If I have 43% of that crowd in here, uh, this podium would be tipped over most of the time. Tables would be, you know, I, 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 what it's showing us is that there's a lot of ineptitude in the American church. Just, just frank, that's just, and I know there's a lot of pastors in here, uh, and you guys need to hear it as much as we need to hear it. We're not teaching, we're not catechizing our people well enough. That's the bottom line, except for FBC, Mike. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then finally go to number six. <clears throat> number six, religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. Let's read that again. Religious belief, your theology, is a matter of personal opinion, what you think it is. It is not an objective truth, an objective reality. 38% of American Christians believe that statement to be true. Okay? There are things in the survey regarding uh, human sexuality, homosexuality, uh, uh, stuff like, uh, um, you know, you can choose what your gender is, whether or not you want to be male and female, or and all this other stuff, uh, mar- or uh, sex outside of marriage, and all of this, and, and it's amazing how uh, the two uh, data sets begin to converge when we get into more worldview uh, discussions um, about things. And hold on, Gary. And um, uh, that's concerning. Again, it's an example of the Church of Jesus Christ kowtowing, bending its knee uh, to the secular view on a whole lot of things. What this does for me, and the reason I'm doing this in this brand new year, is because we need to have our cages rattled a little bit, um, and we need to identify where the chinks in our armor are, where the holes in our fence are, and where we are deficient in shepherding our brothers and our sisters and our wives and our kids and our friends and everything else. A lot of people, and I've told you this before, I have a lot of my family, my blood, that identifies as Christian. They would probably identify with those four points of evangelism, but yet there is no evidence 
that they are actually saved. And that's, that's, that's where the problem is. Uh, boy, there are so many things I want to say, but I can't because we're running out of time. So I'm gonna, let, let, me, let me listen to this. <clears throat> the main problem highlighted by the survey is a growing nominalism of the worldview. I kind of said that already which includes people who attend church, at least sometimes, but who are not really committed to the teachings of God's Word and the teachings of the church. They're one and the same. We may tend to think that evangelical churches are filled with Bible-believing Christians, and there have been times in history when that was true, but it's not true today. It is increasingly obvious from the survey that many people in evangelical churches have only a superficial awareness of what Christians actually believe. Less frequent church attendance and lack of commitment to a local church compound the problem. So listen, it is really important that we fall apart in worship, that we are just at our we're at our end in our humanity and we realize that there is nobody that can save us but Jesus the Christ. That God is the creator of the universe. That we are lost completely without Him. We have to come to that end. And at the same time, we have to know what Scripture tells us about life's matters. There is an urgent need in evangelical churches for faithful, deliberate teaching week by week that declares the whole counsel of God, and there is a need for congregations that hunger to know eternal realities rather than desiring superficial entertainment. So how do we address the growing chasm between uh, solid, God-centered, God-seeking theology and theology that has peppered in worldview? That's the thousand-dollar question. The elephant in the room. While we study God's word, yes, but it always has required more than that. The records of the New Testament and the early church show a commitment to systematically teaching biblical truths. You guys read this today in Luke chapter 1. Luke wrote to Theophilus to give him an orderly account so that he would have certainty concerning the things that that have been taught. The word Luke Luke uses for taught is catecheo, from which we get the word catechism. The Catholic Church has hijacked that to meaning an indoctrination to their Uh, traditions. That's what it means. But it's deeper than that. It means going to school globally, learning what God says about himself and about how to behave, and then submitting, yielding to a pastor, elders, other men within your fellowship that guide you. This is what the Band of Brothers does, that guide you along those paths so that you understand, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, what is correct and what is error. Martin Luther said it this way, don't know what was said only, but what was meant. The historic or the classic error in in Scripture is context. Context matters. My granddaughter, I was with her on Saturday. She goes, uh, Papa Scott, she calls me Papa Scott. She goes, she's got a, she's got a, a mug and it's got a tea bag in it. She goes, how many times can I reuse a tea bag? And I'm all, sweetheart, what? No, how many times can I reuse a tea bag? And I said, well, just once. It's good. That tea bag is good for one cup of tea. She says, no, 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 I don't think so. And she flipped it over and she goes, it says right here, makes four to six cups. Her context she thought that she could use that bag four to six times, but every time she uses it, the, the tea gets weaker. That's context. When your context is uh, in error in Scripture, your theology then errors. If we're Lone Ranger Christians and read Scripture only, listen to me, 
if we're Lone Ranger Christians, we don't do this, and we read Scripture only, that's called Soli Scriptura, that means Scripture only, without contextual guardrails and pastoral correction, our theology will drift into error. Why? Because we're human. This is why we read Scripture and study under solid seminary-trained pastors and elders who aren't afraid to correct the error. That is sola scriptura, or Scripture alone. It's why we lean on the heritage of great vetted theologians of the past. It's why we ask questions and read good theolo- theologically. Excuse me. I'm trying to talk too fast. But this is why we ask questions and we struggle and wrestle. And this is why we read good, theologically sound books. Ask us about the books, okay? Uh, This man right here is a voracious reader. (laughs) I can't keep up with him. He's, He's read more books than all of us put together. I probably would guarantee that. He can read a book in a sitting. Anyway, um, to study, I'm sorry, the study of God's Word doesn't need to be a dry and dusty academic pursuit. Your theology shapes and molds and matures you. The pursuit of the knowledge of God and His truth is is intended to lead us to know and worship Him. Period. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's out of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You read stuff like that, and it will help you understand the complexities of God's Word. This isn't a complicated book. We just have to read it. However... We're going to screw it up if we rely on it just on our own merit, on our own accord. Uh, William uh, Simmerton, Simmington, he was a Presbyterian pastor in the uh, 18th century. Uh, he, he did it really well, summed it up like this. Our object should not be to have Scripture on our side, but to be on the side of Scripture. And however dear any sentiment may have become by being long entertained, as soon as it is seen to be contrary to the Bible, we must be prepared to abandon it without hesitation. So I said in the beginning, obviously with a group of this size, I can't possibly know where your theology lies on every piece of doctrine. I can only encourage and preach what I know. I was telling Mark uh, out in the foyer as we we're greeting you guys coming in that, that I, there is so much in this cavity, that's why I burned off all my hair, <laughs> trying to wrestle with the truth and understanding and organizing and writing, um, it's arduous. A lot of you guys know what, what this is like, but if we don't do, go through that struggle, um, you can't grow. You can't advance your theology. So, is the Gary, come back up here as we, as we close. I knew this was going to happen, but I, I, I got in what I wanted to get in, so praise God. Um, but this is a brand new year. We have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I don't know what the year is going to bring completely, but I do know this. I know that God's in control, always has been. Uh, next week, we're going to jump back into John with, uh, with Dr. Warren uh, Frankel, and we're going to start exploring what it means to be born again. So it's a great opportunity to, it's a brand new year, bring people that you've been working on. If you've got to go to their house and you've got to go, Taylor, come here, and you grab them by the scruff of their neck, I only grabbed you because, yeah, you're the youngest dude up here. But you know what I mean? They need to hear the gospel. And unless they hear the gospel, they can't respond to it. Unless we preach it and teach it, uh, it's the work that we got to do. So again, Father, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for these men. I thank you for the truth in your word. Bless us and bless us and bless us. Overwhelm us with yourself, Father, as we just continually seek you. And until we're glorified and we're standing in your presence directly, Father, 
and looking at you face to face, Father, we need you here to be with us, to protect us, and to guide us again, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're not going to find a worship band this packed, this awesome. Rick, harmonica, come on. That's, 
It's Pastor Robles, only Pastor Robles. Thank you, man. Hey, so uh, what? Who who wrote that song? Uh, Do you know? Okay. I thought my. Uh, I mean, these guys years. have been doing a lot of writing lately. I thought my. Uh, was no, but I did put a challenge out to write a new song for this year okay. for the, to the group. So. Amen. Amen. We'll work on, somebody will work on something. Um, I'm going to leave you with a doxology. Again, what does a doxology do? It uh, it manifests praise to to our Father. So yesterday and. Yesterday in, in uh, Psalms reading that we do on Tuesday mornings over at North County, um, we read through the 60s. Listen to Psalm 67. It's only six, seven verses. This is a doxology, men. This is how we offer ourselves as an act of worship. Psalm 67. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the people with fairness and guide the nations on the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce, God. Our God blesses us. God blesses us so that all the ends of the earth may fear him. So what's the state of theology in America? It needs some work, but this is how we fix it. So you know how it works. Grab a man in this brand new year, a brand new fresh blessing. Pray over him, and uh, we will see you next week. God bless you guys. Cheer. I was wrong, Scott. It's Craig Musso. Craig Musso.